Welcome, everybody, uh, to the Prezes On webinar at Sontek. Um, I'm Daniel Wagner um, in San Diego, and Janice Lansfield um, is going to join us live from San Francisco. That's right. Hello, everybody. I'm here at the American Geophysical Union Conference, which is the largest earth science and space science conference in the world. So we actually have the flow tracker with pressure sensor on display here. If you happen to be in San Fran, you can come down and see it. So just a quick overview of what we are planning to discuss today. Um, first of all, just looking at uh, the Flowtrack ADV probe um, and what we've done to implement it into the system or the, the Flowtrack 2 ADV. The actual measurement process, that does slightly differ from your normal uh, top setting or universal weighting rod. Uh, some post-processing uh, features that we've added uh, based on user requirements, and then how can you apply the flow back in the field, these various ways. And then we've allocated a couple of minutes um, at the end for questions and answers. Um, so please feel free. To, uh, to post your questions, and um, if we don't have time today to answer them, we are planning to get it back to you within the next couple of days. And I, I would also like to point out, this is a pretty straightforward topic, so I don't think we're going to take a full hour. Um, it's probably going to be more like a 30-minute webinar in this case. So we get out of class early today. So before we launch too much into the technical topics, what I usually like to do is kind of give us the sort of the bigger picture of why Sontech would do this um, and why now. And the reason for that is, well, first of all, the flow tracker is Sontech's most popular instrument. And so, of course, we feel feedback from the field all the time. And this, this has been a recurring question over the years. And um, but you know people have people have used the weighting rod and, and um, other methods to get the depth. Uh, but we recently redesigned the flow tracker, and it's it's the most high tech instrument out there to do these kind of field measurements. But still, there's a couple things that we do in a manual fashion, and it's very manual. One of those is reading the depth of the water um, by looking at the lines on a weighting rod. Um, you really can't get much more low tech than, than that, other than maybe putting a stick in the water and notching it with a pocket knife. Uh, and then positioning the sensor in the proper depth to be taking the velocity measurement. Uh, and that's also done in a, in a manual fashion, moving it up and down on a weighting rod and adjusting the vernier scale in the case of a top setting weighting rod that you see pictured here on the screen. And uh, you would even have to do some math in your head uh, to, to adjust that vernier scale properly. And then finally, most low tech of all, this, this depth measurement where the measurement's being taken is not even recorded anywhere um, in a low tech or high tech way. So we did see room for improvement. Uh, but before we moved on to do that improvement, we wanted to make sure we, we had the right, the tools and the ability to implement it properly. And we do now. As Janice, I agree that the, I think with the next couple of slides, it will become evident how the pressure sense itself will improve the operation, especially the accuracy and uncertainty in the measurement itself during uh, depth measurements. So, uh, sort of, so what of being able to capture those depth readings are are listed on this slide. Uh, but first of all, you know, every, every human being is a little bit different. People are of different heights. People might read the weighting rod a different way, um, might use the vernier scale a slightly different way. So just basically you can standardize your field procedure that much more with an with a actual sensor capturing that reading. And of course, when you're typing in depth readings with your hands, particularly in a distracting field environment. It, it's just one more way you can reduce human error. And of course, with that digital data captured in a time series, you can QA, QC those measurements back at the office, particularly if there's a discrepancy. Uh, whereas before, you might have had no data, for example, on sensor positioning. Now you have that data. Of course, higher resolution data. 
uh, and the ability to analyze water level fluctuations during the course of a measurement. So of course, hopefully there's no discrepancies back at the office. But of course, if there are, this is field work after all, now you do have that extra piece of information to help you come up with a, a logical explanation. And then finally, I know a lot of us use the flow tracker uh, for discharge measurements, but this really opens up the possibility to use this as a tool for, for other projects where depth is perhaps more important than velocity, such as for habitat mapping or hydraulic studies. You're no longer limited to a waiting rod or, or even a tagline. You can go um, off, uh, offline and in any pattern you want, taking um, velocity and depth readings. Yeah, one of one of the um, key features with the with the pressure sensor is that we do collect actual time series of pressure and and water depth data during the velocity measurement. So, in addition to your your velocities, you also get a time series of both those parameters. And you, we are showing that on the bottom right hand corner of the screen, right? So how did Float Sontek uh, implement the PESA sensor in the ADV? Um, we've redesigned the ADV head to, to accommodate the PESA sensor at the bottom. Uh, so if you compare this, the, the ADV head with a float uh, with a pressure sensor with a standard ADV, it's slightly longer. To uh, accommodate the pressure sensor itself, the intake holes or pressure holes is at the bottom um, of the of the ADV and there's a couple of smaller holes on the side as well um, to improve the depth measurements and pressure measurement. Um, so as Janice would like to say, what is the similarity between uh, Flow Tracker 2 ADV um, and the airplane wing? Is both are using the <laughs> Bernoulli principle. Um, so for those of you that, are, that know uh, that theory is that um, any fluid, either air or water, that's passing over an object or around the object will create a change in pressure and obviously the higher the velocity um, the bigger the pressure change. So we've incorporated real-time adjustment uh, or correction on the pressure measurements uh, based on that principle. Yeah, I think uh, as we worked on this project I learned a lot more and, and uh, it's one of those cases where it makes perfect sense, but you don't think of all the details until after you learn them. But Sontech corrects for many other things. Of course, water speed and the Bernoulli pin principle is a huge one. But in addition, we also added um, rigorous corrections for temperature over the full range of the operating, operating range, salinity, and altitude even. Because, of course, the altitude that you're using the sensor at will affect the density of the water, and the density of the water uh, will affect the amount of pressure it puts on the sensor. So of, of, it's great to be able to correct for that even. And we can because the Flow Tracker 2 has a GPS built in too. So all of these things put together offer a very um, uh, uh, good solution that we actually have the patent pending on. So during, during the design of, of uh, the flow track with pressure sensor of, of accommodating uh, dynamic pressure correction, um, we basically take the Bernoulli equation and there's a couple of components. The first component is dynamic pressure and then the second component is uh, static pressure and then the actual pressure measurement by the instrument itself. So the the, the, the component that's affected by the velocity is, is of course the dynamic pressure and you can see here with this um, image from the CFD uh, model developed on the flow tracker that the velocity around the probe is different from the actual point measurement where we perform the velocity measurements. Um, so to enable us to determine what the impact is of the instrument on the velocity, we've done a number of lab tests to determine uh, pressure correction coefficient or a drag coefficient um, to, to correct for, uh, to account for the correct velocity in the calculations. Um, and the formula that we use at the end is the pressure corrected um, equals basically the, the measured pressure by the instrument and then accounts for the dynamic pressure at the end. 
So during the, the, the uh, lab tests that we've done in development, um, we've uh, mounted an instrument on a tow cart um, in a towing tank at a fixed depth and then run it at different velocities. Uh, started at 10 centimeters a second and ended up at 1.1 meters a second. And this graphic just depicts what uh, or verifies uh, the Bernoulli principles for start and shows the, the impact of the dynamic pressure on the actual measurements. Um, so we have the development of the coefficient to correct for uh, pressure correction as we only use a certain portion of the velocities measured uh, to exclude all external interference such as spikes and acceleration and deceleration of the tow cart. Um, and from there we've developed a, a graph uh, pressure versus velocity um, and then developed a linear regression on top of that. So that coefficient is then implemented in the in the Bernoulli equation um, to account for the dynamic pressure and then calculate the actual uh, corrected uh, water depth. Yeah, what's most striking to me about um, those graphs and the result is that, um, you know, we talk about the Bernoulli principle in principle, and we can talk about its effect on flowing water and on the flow tracker in particular, but now we can actually see it, it is, it's real, and it, it applies to the flow tracker. We can measure it and we can quantify it. And so, of course, we can, um, we can correct for that in the field now. So that was, um, and we just wanted to give you an appreciation for the theory and, and what went into the design of our solution here. So we're going to move on now to kind of the operational considerations, um, the practical things. And first of all, uh, of course, we're going to use the pressure sensor to measure the, the water depth first. And it's, even if you could, it's not desirable to take the sensor all the way down to the riverbed. So you'd want to take it down to the same place every single time before you capture a depth reading. Uh, and it's best before you begin your measurement to just decide on what that offset is and then enter that into the setup. Uh, here's a picture of a top setting rod um, that shows what you might put as a probe offset. Um, you can take it all the way down to where the springs in that picture would limit you. But um, Daniel actually has uh, a, a better method that's a little bit more robust and easier to do in the field probably, which is to look at the top setting rod. Um, yes, yeah, so, you know, the, the condition of each top setting rod varies from users and organizations. Um, and to, to depend on, on the actual spring located at the bottom of the base plate uh, as a reference, I would suggest um, should be avoided. Um, what we've done is just decide on a marking on, on a vernier scale on a top setting rod and then use that as a guide. So for example, I think if you set it to uh, 0.2, then it means it's around 80 millimeters from the base plate. So I suggest the site on a vernier scale um, a reference um, in the office and then you can very accurately measure the distance from the base plate to the bottom of the transducer. So that distance is, 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 is important. There's a specific field in the software that requires you to enter that value, um, and you need to, to determine that fairly accurately, because that will impact your measurement accuracy. Um, one thing that I've noticed during measurements, if you, especially if you do a two-point method, if your, vernier, if your offset is fairly close to your 0.8 depth, your amount of adjustments made during a measurement is reduced. Um, now that means you're probably going to end up with a different offset every time. If you want to go that path, that, that's um, useful. Just making sure that you do measure the probe offset accurately because that will definitely impact the accuracy of lead measurements. Moving on from hardware uh, to just the, the software screen that you'll see on the flow tracker handheld. So uh, this is what the setup screen looks like. First of all, do you want to use the pressure sensor just because you have it? You don't have to use it for depth. And then as we discussed, uh, you'll enter the probe offset that you'll be um, using, as is shown in the previous slide. And then finally, you'll be asked uh, how often you want to do a pressure calibration. Or in other words, how often do you want to zero the pressure sensor for 
an atmospheric offset. Uh, and because uh, you know the, the barometric pressure could be changing over the course of your measurement, you want to make sure you're periodically uh, updating that offset. And there's no industry standard for this, but the flow tracker will default to 30 minutes. Uh, that's definitely, Janice, a user configuration. Um, and you know, the more uh, you could basically perform a, a, a barometric calibration every at every station, it's going to take you longer. So it's it's all depending on what the user requirements are and how frequent they want to calibrate it. But the option is there to do that. Right. So kind of just just on the same theme to to remind people though there's more than one way to make a depth measurement of course more than one way to even use the flow tracker based on your particular region of the world so on the left hand side we show you how the screen looks if you're choosing to use the pressure sensor for depth it's actually kind of as close to a video game as you'll probably be able to get in the field where you get those two red arrows to, to line up and then you know your sensors at the right measurement location. But if you don't want to use the pressure sensor, you'll, you'll see these other options that the Flow Tracker 2 still has. Uh, we still help you um, set the top setting rod uh, with that graphic there or a universal rod for bottom setting or even if you're using an under ice rod, there's a graphical help that way too. Uh, so you're helped regardless on the screen um, and you can even you know, choose to toggle among uh, the pressure sensor or another measurement during the course of the measurement. So um, none, of the, none of this will ever limit your ability to, to choose. Yeah, I think one, one, one advantage of the software, of flow tracker software, is that um, you have the ability to navigate in and out the menu system. So even if you start at the measurement using a pressure sensor and for some reason decide to, to use uh, the top setting rod graphics again, you can go to the home screen application settings and uh, opt to display the top setting rod. So you have that ability to navigate and change functions during a measurement, which is a very uh, a nice feature for this purpose. So on the utilities menu in the in the soft uh, flow tracker software, most of the functions there are to diagnose. Um, instrument operations as well as uh, measurement conditions. We don't actually record data displayed there except for the beam check option. Um, so in this case, it's similar to the pressure sensor. Uh, we do give you a couple of features that allows you to diagnose or verify the operation of the instrument without creating a measurement file and adding those additional steps if you don't need it. Um, so in this case, you can either do a, a, comp a, a uh, pressure sensor calibration, perform an instrument measurement depth or determine the total depth and then we also supply the graphics to that. So, so for example if you're just capturing some data for reconnaissance you can just take it out there make some make some spot measurements and see what's going on. This just measurement process is very similar to what you were used to uh, at a top setting or universal weighting rod. Um, you will open a data collection screen or window and then start adding stations, very similar to that uh, previous process. The one function that we've now added is, or that's available to you, is to perform a depth measurement using a pressure sensor. So what you will see here is that there's uh, some text incorporated next to depth which says push for pressure sensor, uh, so they, on your on your handout itself there is a, a square key or enter key, you press that and then it, it basically activates the pressure sensor to take a measurement. Um, we have made the software flexible, so you can, instead of doing that, actually type in a manual reading in the same field. So it's either you can decide in the field, you're not getting a good pressure sensor reading for some reason, uh, you would rather uh, reference it to, to the top setting rod or universal rod. Um, one thing that, uh, if I remember correctly, that requirement, we don't accommodate both at the same time. So depth measurements 
uh, with pressure sensor and, and wiring rod. So if you want to record both, then you will have to enter the, the top setting rod or the universal wiring rod measurement in the comments value for that purpose. Right. Yes, that's right. Um, the discharge measurement itself, um, when you perform a, a, a total depth or water depth measurement, um, we do to display the bubble or tilt sensor on the screen as well. And that's an important aspect because the flow track is offset from the waiting rod. So any angle induced on the waiting rod will affect the depth measurement as well. So it's highly recommended that you keep the tilt bubble within less than 5 degrees as long as it's green. Um, even a 5 degree will have a certain amount of error, so try to keep it as vertical as possible. Um, this, is the other op this is the other closest to a video game moment you'll get in the measurement process. It will turn red once you exceed the, <laughs> the degree threshold. So. Yeah, we do supply a, a, a lot of information and as Jan has mentioned, yeah, you know, it, it, it could it can become very busy if 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 it, and I think that's one of the features of some with the flow track is that you need to be a bit more focused towards the information that's supplied with flow track too. Um, do you have well, any the nice thing about I'm sorry, Daniel. I'm just going to say the nice thing about having all this data on the screen while you're doing the measurement is you can see right away whether or not it's good or if there's errors or there's questions. So you don't drive back to the office and, and then see this, this issue. You see it in real time and fix it. So uh, in this case, it's, um, once you get used to the screen, it's, it's, you can sort of get a lot of information at a single glance and streamline the process. Yeah, that's, Go ahead. That's, Sorry. That's, yes, no, that, no, I agree. That, that's definitely one of the advantages. Um, so to perform a depth measurement, um, as I said previously, if you press the Enter key on the handheld, and then this screen appears. So with normal operations, if you're using a top setting rod or universal rod, we would have displayed a certain graphic depicting the type of rod you were using. Now in this case, we are using the actual pressure sensor. So you will see these two arrow uh, arrows on either side of the line. Um, the right arrow indicates the required depth you need to set the instrument to, and then the left arrow shows you the current position. So these are two sliding arrows um, that, that, you, that guides you to, to adjust the instrument. And we have a color code scheme for indicating the, uh, the accuracy level. So if the arrow keys turn to green, you're within 5 millimeters. If it's between 5 and 20, it's orange. And then above that, uh, above 20 millimeters, it will be a, a highlighted in red. I would, I would highly suggest not to uh, because especially if there's wave action on the water surface, as long as you get green, I would suggest to accept that. I don't think that will impact the measurement, measurement accuracy at all um, when you place the instrument in position. Um, it would be very difficult in turbulent conditions to get it precisely every time. Uh, so the, the measurement process that you used to with current meters and, and uh, flow tracker in the past using a top setting or universal orders is a stepped approach. So when you start at a station, you will start at point 8 depth and then move up uh, 2.2 if you're using the 2 point method and then you move, when you move to the next station, obviously you will start at point 2 and then move down to point 8 and that's to reduce uh, adjustment uh, during the measurement and speed up the measurement process. With the pressure sensor, obviously that's not feasible because we have to determine the total depth at every station every time. So you will always start at the bottom and then move the probe up, upwards towards the surface um, if it's a two-point method. And, and that process you will repeat for every single station. Um, one thing that I probably could notice, um, take into account the time frame required to calibrate uh, the pressure sensor to atmospheric pressure. Uh, because you, you really want to do that when the pressure sensor is close to the water surface. Um, because that will only reduce the, the amount of adjustment as well. So to take it out of the water at 0.2 depth is not that big an exercise, but if you're at the bottom of, 
of the of the channel when you're doing a total depth or 0.8 that's going to take a bit more time to do that so we're kind of getting close to wrapping up what the measurement process looks like and on the left hand side there you'll see this is the you'll actually see a time series of the depth in real time not only the instantaneous depth but a moving average uh, and then once the measurement is over like all the other data that you've captured in your 40 or 60 second measurement you can review all of those parameters uh, and now in, you can include reviewing the depth measurement as well Yeah, I think I just want to maybe reiterate what, what, what Janice mentioned previously about the information that, that we do supply. We do supply a significant amount of information more than the previous flow tracker and even any other instrument on the market. And, and, and the reason for that is, is, is quality assessment of the measurement itself. And, and what I've found during all the testing and measurements is that if you manage your measurement process well, so that means if you evaluate the data during your 40 seconds or 60 seconds that you measure, that will just reduce the time that you're going to spend at the end of the point velocity measurement or at the end of the station to review everything again. Um, so if you've spent time during the measurement reviewing the time series that's collected, your depth, uh, SNR plots, and, and velocity, you only really need to evaluate your summary table that's supplied at the end. We do supply the graphics at the end again but I would suggest if you go through that process, it will cut down on the measurement time. And finally, back at the office, this is a, a slide showing what the Flow Tracker 2 desktop software looks like. And uh, we have made some ad additions to the Flow Tracker 2 desktop software. Uh, and no, most notably, and on, on this slide, you'll see we've added a tab called Samples. So whereas we were before, we were really limited. Flow Tracker, the the original Flow Tracker, didn't really let you see this at all. But now you get to see your 40 or 60 second time series of uh, all these different parameters, of course, including the depth parameter. So yes, once again, back at the office, you can see what the depth was and also what the fluctuations were during the course of even your point measurement and of, as well as uh, the, the entire cross-section measurement. So this, this feature that we've added the sample tab um, does give the user the ability, especially during auditing um, and reviewing of the measurement, to determine what possible impacts there may be. So for example, if you have uh, a 40-second uh, time series of the measurement, and you can see but there's a variation in velocity, you can now compare it with, all right, what happened to the, the pressure data um, that your water depth increased during the measurement. Um, and, you know, that can then guide you and say, all right, but, you know, something happened during the stage of that either increased or decreased, so your velocity should be relatively impacted as well. So this is a very handy tool, especially in, in, in the post-processing and auditing um, aspects. And then uh, finally, we did add a PDF uh, graphics to the PDF discharge measurement summary and that comes out of the Flow Tracker 2 software. So we do take all of this data, we do package it in a nice PDF report with these graphics, including what you'll see on the left-hand side in this slide is the beam check. So of course the beam check is a monitor of the, the health of the instrument, so to speak whether your signal strength is adequate, um, whether the signal characteristics are adequate, and uh, it's another further QC check on, on the data that you're getting out of the instrument. Uh, and of course, now that we have a pressure sensor, uh, we can show you that in graphical form as well. So on the right-hand side, there's uh, um, the pressure in, in summary form. it actually was changing uh, over the course of the measurement. So once again, this isn't just a theory. That measurement that was taken uh, did change.
Um, the following is just a couple of applications. I think the, the flow tracker is a, is a unique instrument in the sense of there's almost no limitation to it except you know, the ability for a user to, to operate in those conditions. That's probably the limiting factor. Um, there's a wide range of, of, of applications that, that suits the instrument um, and we've seen it over the years that you know, even using the flow tracker and in modeling or uh, treatment plants where they want to determine the hydraulic characteristics of the flows around structures, um, discharge coefficients um, and so forth, uh, is something that, that can be done with the flow tracker itself. Um, you know, we, our normal users and most of our users is, is, is focus on discharge measurement. Um, the flow tracker software also accommodates a specific mode called general mode which doesn't calculate discharge at all. So we're only interested in point velocity measurements at different locations. Um, almost like uh, a number of waypoints that you can plot on, a, on a Google Earth for example and then determine the velocity at each of those locations without calculating discharge or, or the need to determine a distance between the points. So this really does open up and we've shown some pictures here on the screen just to give you an idea of the flexibility the instrument has even more so than before. So you can use it, for example, at pipe outflows um, from bridges, um, places where you can't even see the water to make it to read a water level off a rod, um, for example, that in, inside a pipe or a pipe access, uh, places where there is no tagline. Um, so in this in this marshy area shown, next to structures where there's really no practical way to to look over the edge and read a line. So all of these all of these different um, these different applications are are now more accessible than before. So yes, if um, if you're using the flow tracker with the pressure sensor, we'd love to hear from you and see what um, what applications you've got it applied to. All right, so this brings us to the to the end of the webinar, um, and uh, we have a couple of questions um, that users posted to us. Uh, one that, that seems to be uh, fairly common is, um, you know, when will we be able to do a flow tracker measurement with no tag line, or can you add a uh, high accuracy uh, DGPS or RTK system to the flow tracker itself? Uh, currently. The flow tracker doesn't have that capability um, to, to add external uh, GPS systems. It has an internal GPS, although uh, only the GPS accuracy, your normal handheld, um, and depends on the accuracy, you know, if you're going to get s pass corrections or not. Um, that purpose is, was mainly implemented for, or the GPS was mainly implemented for referencing the, the measurement um, on a map and enter those coordinates into either a hydrological database, but it has an, a unique purpose where you do perform measurements in uh, floodplains or marsh areas where you know that accuracy is within a required, um, is acceptable for that uh, type of measurement. Uh, so here's a question. Uh, I already have a flow tracker to uh, can I add a pressure sensor? And uh, the short answer to that is no. If you want to have a pressure sensor incorporated into a, your flow tracker probe, you have to order it that way from the factory, and we build it that way. Uh, but I will say, if you already have a flow tracker too, you have two pieces. You have a handheld unit, and you have the probe uh, with the cable. And because the Flow Tracker 2, unlike the Flow Tracker 1, has interchangeable, um, these parts are interchangeable, you don't have to buy a whole new instrument. You can just buy a new probe with the pressure sensor in it. And then, for example, you would have a backup or you have one to use depending on the, the, um, the environment you're going into. So you can interchange any standard probe with a pressure sensor probe. Another, another question that came up was, uh, will the pressure sensor increase the accuracy at a discharge site um, that's obtained in high vegetative areas that can cause s &R problems? The, the pressure sensor itself will definitely improve the accuracy of your depth 
your water depth measurement as well as the location of the instrument itself. Um, however, the flow track is still dependent on the measurement principles that it's based on. Uh, so any, any object that can affect the, the, the measurement or impacting on the measurement volume will affect the measurement itself. The unique thing that we have now, and I think that's probably the biggest feature that's in the flow tracker too, um, and we probably don't focus on it enough, is the, the beam profile plot that we display before you do a measurement. So you will notice when you adjust the pressure sensor um, on uh, those two sliding bars, on the right hand side of that was a beam, beam profile plot. And that shows you if there's any obstacle impacting the measurement. And that's a good guide to determine if either the, the, the opposite the bank or a rock or obstacle is going to impact the measurement. And that should be used as a guide to determine if you're going to do a velocity measurement at that specific location. Here's a question. Um, what is the sample rate of the pressure sensor? So the, the, pressure, the pressure sensor is sampled at the same rate as the velocity data. Um, and well, I guess perhaps output is the, is, the correct, is the correct word. And we output velocity data at 2 hertz. We also output pressure data at 2 hertz, uh, which for a handheld sensor is, is um, at the accuracy that we're doing it is actually pretty impressive. And so 2 hertz. Right, so the, the color codes or arrows that were shown um, in the presentation for the pressure sensor, so as I mentioned previously, the left arrow indicates the current position of the sensor, the right arrow shows the, the, the position where it should be placed. So those uh, color codes, if it's within 5 millimeters, that means the instrument position is within 5 millimeters of, this, of the proposed location. Um, and then obviously, 5 to 20 moles means that the instrument is within 20 moles of that location. So it just gives you a location of how much you need to adjust the instrument to get to that specific point. Um, that's basically the purpose of that. Right, uh, the depth offset relative to the channel characteristics, um, that's probably one thing uh, that needs to be taken into account that I don't think we've mentioned during the presentation. As I said previously, there's a standard offset at the bottom where you determine the distance from the bottom of the basic sensor or ADB to the, to the channel depth, and you can either use the vernier scale to guide you or universal rod increments. But there's something else that can impact that process as well. And that is if there's obstacles in a channel. So for example, if you measure a natural, uh, natural channel and, uh, and, the, and the channel bed itself comprises of uh, boulders uh, or pedals, pebbles, then that means you can't get the probe as close to the bottom as you would like. So then you will have to increase the offset itself. If there's vegetation, that's not really going to impact um, the depth measurement, so that I don't wouldn't think would be a huge issue. I, I would think more, you know, uh, boulders and stuff and the rocks that that will prevent you from lowering the instrument low, and then also you don't want to damage your pressures or your, your instrument. So you don't want to get it so close to obstacles that can damage the the, the probes itself. Um, Flow Tracker 2 software, um, desktop software was designed from, from scratch, so we've, there was a number of requirements during the development and we've, we've de designed a package that I think accommodates most requirements. Um, we've also ensured that existing users with original Flow Trackers or Flow Tracker 1 can make use of the software as well. Um, so you can, if you create uh, if you export your WAD file from your original flow tracker and the four ASCII files uh, that accompany that, all those files need to be in the same, same folder. So your WAD file plus the four ASCII export files needs to be located in the same folder. Then you can convert that file 
or that data set to the file, the new Flow Tracker 2 file format. And I've been promoting this to at every office I'm visiting. That's one thing that I would say. You know, if you have original Flow Trackers, start converting those files to the new format. Uh, the Flow Tracker 2 file format is called JSON, which is a new HTML format, and it's a universal format. Um, it's not only focused on hydrographic work. Uh, you will get a lot of people that's doing uh, development on that. Um, and that will just ensure that your data is available for a very, very long time in the future. Um, and that brings us to the end of the, of the questioning uh, for this webinar. Uh, thank you very much for attending. Uh, we are planning, as I mentioned, to get out a document with all the questions posted within the next couple of days and, uh, and a, a, a copy of the presentation or webinar itself. That can be that will be distributed to everybody that is registered. Uh, from my from my point, thank you very much that you've attended. Thanks, everybody. And of course, we always welcome your comments. Um, if you have further questions, our contact info is there. Please don't hesitate to get in touch. Yep. And uh, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to all of you. Thank you very much. Bye.